I'll have students do a value study and then they, they put it in their bag and, and I say, well, where's your value study? Oh, I put it away. And I was like, well, no, you have to like keep looking at that. It reminds you, you know, what your focal point is because it's really easy to get off track. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Byrne. Hi, Michelle. Hello, how are you? Great. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. How is uh, life in New Mexico? Oh, I'm just loving it. It's just been fabulous. I mean, it seems like a crazy time to move my whole entire life and art career across the country, but uh, it's exciting and inspiring, and I'm just really thrilled to be here. So, Well, I've, I've been watching you. Uh, we had Joanna on yesterday, and uh, she was talking about how you guys were out painting, but she, uh, I, I've been watching you on social media, and, and you're, you're just jumping right in. Yeah, it's been really exciting. And I think what makes, actually what makes moving easier is being an artist because there's such an artist community. And uh, thanks to you and lots of other people, I just, well, I, I came out here in September and there was an outdoor art show going on. So I um, I went to it and I met this woman, Marimom Kennedy, and she said, oh, there's a plein air group. We paint every Tuesday. And I said, can I join you next Tuesday? So that was in September, I did. And I joined the um, Santa Fe Planarians. It's a group that, that meets every Tuesday to paint. So it's been like a great way to just get me out as soon as I'm here because, you know, I'm a little timid about, can I go out into the country by myself? Everybody says no. And the city's kind of, you know, taboo right now to go in there and paint. I mean, I could, but I haven't yet. So it's been really great for me. And, and knowing Peggy Immel and Joanna Arnett, Joanna's been really fabulous to know and so helpful in many ways. So it's, it's, really been wonderful. And it's also keeping me homebound, which isn't a bad thing because I have a ton of things to do here. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, that that's, you, you know, you you really pinpointed something I think is really critical. And that is that as an artist, when you get involved in the arts community and, and you got involved, you can tell us how you kind of met some of these people. But you know, when, when you, uh, when you move anywhere or you visit anywhere, I mean, you, you auto automatically have an instant family built in. I mean, literally, I would say almost anywhere in the world, you can pick up the phone and text somebody and say, Hey, I'm in town. Do you want to go painting? Um, uh, you know, I, you might not say, Hey, can I stay with you? Because you might not know them all that well, but, uh, and, and we have some things on our website that puts people together, but uh, where did you, how did you initially get involved in this entire uh, plein air community? Oh, wow. That was like back in 2006. I was working with a marketing person, Barbara Doherty, who has since passed away. But she said, come to Snow Hill. They do this plein air event. And I was like, what's, what's plein air? I mean, I had been out painting before, but I didn't know there was a word for it. So I went to Snow Hill and I met a whole lot of people way back then. And then right away, I applied to the Annapolis plein air uh, competition. And for some reason, I got in. <laughs> and for some even better reason, I won second prize. I think it was because I had, I had figures in my paintings, and they were bright and colorful and wild and crazy at the time. And I was like, oh, my God. You know? <laughs> so anyway, that was really inspiring. And I met so many people. Like in Telluride, I met Kathy Anderson, who I'm still friends with today. And Got to meet all the whole Connecticut gang, Joanne Mangi and Stephanie Birdsall. And it's just been, you know, everywhere I go and doing the plein air events has really, really enabled me to meet a lot of people. And um, I'm kind of uh, tapering off. Well, we don't have any anymore, but <laughs> I'm, I am I've had decided to taper off for them just to concentrate more on focus on my artwork instead of just trying to uh, spit out a lot of paintings for competitions. It was starting to get to be too much and my body was starting to say, you know, Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> That's really hard. So I, I don't think people really understand uh, what that is like. So if you're on the circuit, you're doing a lot of plein air events. Tell us, you know, what is a typical week like for you or the, the preparation time and everything that's involved? Well, it's a lot of work and uh, preparing and flying somewhere is really a lot of work because I, I would spend like two days just packing up, the box of frames and canvases and trying to decide like what you think you're going to want to paint and what size you think you're going to want to paint. So uh, flying is way harder. So driving to places is a lot easier, but I have a large minivan, which I fill to the brim. <laughs> 
So I have every option, which is good and bad, but um, it's a lot of lot of work. And then when you get there, it's you know it's rather stressful because you have to be at certain places at certain times, and <clears throat> you have to produce a certain amount of paintings. So in the beginning, I would go overboard, and I I my goal at the time was to do as many as I could, which was a mistake because I should have been concentrating on doing fewer that were better. But that's something I learned over the years. But um, it's, you know, it's very stressful. And as I get older, I see these young people coming into them and they're doing like getting up at 4 a.m. to do sunrise and staying up till two to do a nocturne. And I'm thinking, ah, I can't do that, <laughs> you know? So uh, I am it's doing- a, It's a mindset thing, Michelle. Yes, yes. <laughs> you can do it. You're well, still healthy. Yeah, I, I could, but- uh, You I just guess don't I, want to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I feel like I'm beating myself up. So I am doing, supposedly I'll be doing Santa um, Sedona in October, whether they have it or not, I don't know, but it'll, it'll be an interesting one. I kind of signed up at the last minute because it's for women only. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. You don't get many of those. So, cause it's the year of the women. So um, if that one's still going on and I think it will be in some form and I can drive there, which is nice. So I can fill up my yeah. meat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nice. Well, I think that you you have uh, you've hit a point. Uh, so many people hit that point where you you actually use these plein air events to um, to really brand yourself and to get yourself known because your name is ending up on their promotions. Uh, people are seeing you at the events. You know, as you know, there are people who travel in some cases from event to event. Uh, it's a way to get seen by the judges, uh, and you really can build your career uh, pretty effectively that way along with the other marketing stuff that you do. But then a lot of people get to that point let, that you've gotten to, and that is, okay, now I need to concentrate on my studio work and, and doing more things for myself. Because if you're on the road, you know, 13 weeks, 15 weeks, 20 weeks a year, it, it eats into a lot of your painting ability. And, and then what happens is, at least I've seen this happen, is you get to the point where you're starting to be more selective, not only about where you spend your time, but how much time you're spending on paintings, because uh, the the greats uh, tend to uh, do fewer paintings. You know, we all kind of start out where we do as many as we can, and then it kind of gets back to the point of no, let's do a few, two or three really exceptional paintings that will sell for a lot of money. That's kind of where I I see. A lot of people going where do you see you going yeah that's exactly right because now that i'm out here painting i spend a lot of time like i do a grid before i go out i do when i get there i do a value study and i make sure that i do it and teaching is helpful because i was painting the other day and i did a value study and it wasn't very good and i was going to paint anyway and i thought no you tell your students if it's not a good one do another one so i did a second value study and it was way better and uh, so i want to concentrate more on doing smaller paintings and then taking them home and doing larger ones from it, which is historically what plein air painting was all about. So yeah. I'm excited to do that, yeah. So can you explain a value study? Because there are probably some people watching who might not know what that is. Yeah, well, I'm a big, big proponent of them. And when I teach, I, I make everybody do one. So I have some here. Uh, this is the one that I just did uh, in La Trampas, which is uh, about an hour from here. It's a beautiful, uh, church, but um, I don't know if you can see this. So yeah, it, hold it a little closer. Okay. Okay. So so it's, a, it's a sketch. Yeah, yeah. It's four inch. It's on a four inch by six inch index card. So I get them at Walmart and I put them in this little box that uh, I thought I had it around here, but it, it has markers in it. They're four, 20, 40, 60, 80% and black markers. So or you can do it with a pencil or a pen, whatever you're comfortable with. I used to be a graphic designer, so I'm comfortable with markers because that's that was my the way I did my layouts back when. But um, basically, I figure out like where I want my uh, focal point to be, and and I I do this thing called a dominant diagonal, a dominant vertical, and a dominant horizontal, and they all kind of meet up where I want my focal point to be. So that's where I want you to look, and that's what the story's all about. So I figured that all out, you know, when I get there. But as I was saying earlier, this oh, is- Oh, wait, wait, hold that back up again. I, I I want to see the others, but so DV is dominant vertical. Right. And then DD is dominant diagonal. And 
and then DH is dominant horizontal. So you're you're kind of using a uh, almost a golden mean for your horizontal and your vertical. And then how do you determine where your diagonal is? You, it always intersects those two lines? Well, not always, but it's usually close. And here there was a strong uh, like pathway that came this way. And I thought, well, I'll use that. And there's actually another one from the top here. The clouds kind of also go down towards where I want you to look. So it's all about making the viewer go where you want them to go. So you are, you're the director and you make people look where you want them to look rather than just go out and paint a scene and hope it looks good, which is what, what I used to always do. But um, so that was, that was the second one I did though. The first one, and I had to laugh because my students always do this. They run out of paper, which is what I did. I started drawing the church and I started adding to the one side and then I ran out of paper and I was like, oh, well, that's good enough. And I thought, no, I kept hearing myself tell my students, do another one, you know? So I was like, all right, because that's what's really good about teaching. I can hear myself telling others what to do. And then I think, oh yeah, you should do that. You know, you tell everybody to do it, so you should do it too. So practice what you preach. Yeah, yeah. So uh, then I had the painting that I did, which, which, was also, I mean, we, I was with Joanna Arnett and um, Peggy Immel, and we had done a morning painting, and then we ate lunch by a creek and was very relaxing. So by the time we got here, it was getting pretty hot. So we, we only painted, you know, till maybe three o'clock, trying to see if you can see that without a glare. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. It's Beautiful. hard because you're back, this is all backwards. But anyway, I, I got to a point where I just couldn't paint anymore, but it was mostly there. And when we were about ready to leave, some people came and I was like, oh, you know, so I took my sketch back, which I had, you know, sticking on the top of my easel and I put the people in. I don't know if you can see them, but yeah, I put them in where I wanted them to be. And they also follow this kind of angle up towards the focal point. So, you know, you have to, I didn't always do this. And this is what I want to work more on is really focusing on directing your eye and having a good composition. And uh, that's, that's my new focus. So, so did, did it, so the temptation would be on the painting itself to just go ahead and try to lay the people in, but it, it seems like you put it on the sketch so that you don't mess up the painting and then you do them later. Right. Well, not usually I'll do them right then and there, but oh, the, you people, will. the people came when we were pretty much cleaning up <laughs> and I wasn't even going to add people in. And then I was like, Oh, but the, the good point about having people there is that you can measure how high they are in uh, relationship to the arch the way and how, you know, where their feet are. So if I'm out painting and people walk by, I'll just really quickly sketch in their height. And, you know, if you put a person in and they're, and they're not the right proportion, it just isn't going to read well. So I spend a lot of time like, and if I'm somewhere painting and no one shows up, I'll just you know, yell to a person or tell who I'm painting with, would you go stand there just so I can get your height and figure out how a person would fit into that scene? So uh, real that quickly, real quickly, Michelle, I'm going to share the screen of, of your, um, your video because it's talking about putting uh, people in the figures. And so there's the, the video of, this is one we did in Texas, you know, and it's about in painting impressionistic figures. I think that's the one that won the uh, video of the year, wasn't it? Is that the one or was it another one? Uh, it was actually the second one. <laughs> second one. And so uh, anyway, so in the video, I assume you kind of talk about how to get the, the figures into the, the scene and figure out the perspective and all that stuff. Is that right? Uh, yes, exactly. And can, um, you give us, can you give us a tip on uh, perspective of figures? Is there any way you could do that for us today? Just a quick tip. Um, well, I, it's kind of hard to say, but mostly you have to line them up with the, like I was saying, the proportions. If the proportions are right, and if the proportions of the people are right, a lot of people tend to make their heads big and round and bulbous. And it's all about body language. So I don't have like a formula for the uh, proportions of people in particular. Like some people have the head is one ninth. I, I don't really do that. It's all more visual and intuitive. but the best suggestion I have is just to sketch a lot of figures, just a lot of them. And if you how, do you, how do you figure out the perspective? Isn't it? I, it seems to me, I remember 
the the head or the eyeballs basically need to be where the horizon line is. Is that right? Exactly. And in my third video, um, Palette Knife Cityscapes, I know if you don't paint cityscapes, it might not sound like something you want to see, but I go into great, great depth about uh, the proportion. And yes, your eye level is in total relationship with the horizon line. So it's easy if you're at the ocean because people's eye level will be right at the ocean. And if you're outside, it's a little more different. A lot of times in the cities, you can't even see the horizon line, but you can kind of envision where it is. And if you're standing and your people are standing, all your eyes line up or your tops of your heads, with the exception of short people and tall people. Of course, that wouldn't work, but um, it's it's really amazing. And in that last video, I show photographs of people in the city and everybody's head is basically lined up with the exception of tall and short people. And when I show examples of that, people don't believe me. And then when they look at photos, it's like, oh, yeah. Unless the people are going down a steep hill or climbing up a mountain, of course. Right. So they're painting behind you. They're actually walking up. Looks like they're walking up a hill. Oh, there's like steps that go up to the thing. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. And so you're, but you always put in, I, I would assume you always put in a horizon line, even if you can't see it, you know, you're, you're basing all your architecture and everything on that horizon line. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's, it's a lot different out here though, because I've been, we've been going out and painting uh, landscapes. So it's like, oh, wow. You know, <laughs> so I like to have a, um, at least a building or something like we went out, this is the last one I did with the plein air planarians and it was of a, a truck so i was kind of treating the truck as my obviously focal point but see how the clouds come down the light comes down towards the truck and everything kind of points to that because it's my focal point point. and if that was a person of course you know it would be the same thing because if you add a person to your landscape it's going to grab people's eye like right away so you have to be careful that you don't have your focal point like here and then add a bunch of people over here because then you're you're not going to know where to look and it gets a little confusing. Yeah, Joe McGurl always said said to me that the minute, if you're doing a landscape, the minute you add a person, it becomes about the person, not the landscape. Do you agree with that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, unless you could. Yeah, yeah, it does, <laughs> actually. And if the person is looking at you even more so, if it's the back of someone, I guess you and they weren't very brightly colored. But yeah, it pretty much does. In fact, I just did this one. This was the morning one before we did the church one. And obviously there were no people and it's just a small one, but I wanted that shiny tin roof to be the focal point. And I was considering putting the red, a person in red walking down the thing and then I, I didn't do it. So I've been a little timid about that in my figures here because, you know, we're out painting landscapes, but, but that's fine too, because I think I think it's really good as an artist to try everything. Tomorrow we're going to paint a river up in the mountains. So, and, and I enjoy painting everything. And I know people think, you know, I'm known for my cityscapes and my umbrella scenes, but I, I think as an artist, it's really good to challenge yourself and always be trying new things because it's all a matter of uh, looking, really looking and seeing. And um, my biggest advice for plein air painters is to always have a uh, viewfinder with you because it, it just makes life a lot easier when you're outside. Yeah, well, that's great advice. So do you have anything else that you want to show us today? Oh, yeah, let's see. Well, I've been, uh, so, you know, since we're in lockdown here, I'm trying to, you know, I have a million things to do, like get my license, my New Mexico license and my health insurance and all that. But I'm trying to also do these little morning things. Like this is a five by seven of the wall in my backyard. So I, I've been taking this, um, it's oil paper by Royal Talons, and I'm just uh, drawing them, you know, sketching them out the size and then painting on them. And I, I tape around the edges. So I'm doing a series of those. And that's kind of a, maybe a way of making a living, you know, because I'm going to have to try to sell them maybe as Christmas gifts or something. And uh, so that's one thing I'm working on. And then another thing I've been doing a lot of, which I'm just going to touch on lightly because it gets very involved, but I've been using um, these grids. I don't know if you can even see it. Can you see that? Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. It's like dynamic symmetry. So there's a certain proportion. I go out. I, I didn't used to do this like for plein air hardly ever, only in the studio, but I put this grid on my canvas 
And a lot of times all it does is tell me where to put the horizon line and I'll fit things within the grid. <clears throat> So how do you how do you, how do you make that grid? Do you first go corner to corner and then center to bottom? How well, how does that start out? Yeah, um, it's corner to corner, and then you take like this is a twelve by sixteen. So you put a twelve inch from each direction, like the square, and that's uh, uh, there's a word for it. Of course, it's escaping me. So that's the square, and then you draw the square in there and put angle to angle there, and then but. For the third one, what you basically do is you take this proportion sideways and make it a rectangle here. It's called the, uh, I think that's the daughter rectangle. So then you put angles to there. And then it's just, you know, it sounds really complicated. And I learned this all online from the Academy of Composition a few years ago when I decided that, that my, comp my compositions needed some work. And I just happened to meet this guy online uh, Victor Vargas, and he has this whole online school, which that's kind of where I got also got started with the uh, value studies. So it, it's all good and it's all things that, you know, I might put that whole grid on there and it might only help me do two things, but I'll put them at the right spot. So it, it's kind of important. And I've been doing it for every painting before I go out here. And I used to do it a lot and just ignore the grid. <laughs> so now I'm trying to really work with it. And there's so much as artists, I think, to learn. And um, like I kind of knew composition was my weak point about four years ago. So I studied that. And now I think maybe color is my weaker point. So I've been doing these YouTube videos on color. And uh, it's been a real learning process because I had, I had the camera, I had the microphone, I had everything I needed except time. So when this pandemic started, I started doing uh, the first one was on yellow. The second one's on blue. So what it's doing me is for me is it's forcing me to learn the colors so that I can explain them to people. So I'm working on the color red next. And that's been really good. So but this being an artist is such a ongoing learning process. So you, I don't think you ever get to the point where you feel like, ah, oh, I got it all now. You know, I got it all figured out because it, it doesn't work that way. So well, I, I, it, it, it strikes me that uh, once you get to that point, then all of a sudden you start finding a higher level of sophistication and, and start learning how to get even more depth inside the subjects that you know. Exactly, and and your things, I, it's been hard for me to watch all of your things because I was in the midst of moving and everything, but the ones I've gotten to watch have been really informative. Like someone was talking about um, a color, Naples yellow. I don't, I don't use that, I have it. So I was like, oh, I should start using my Naples yellow. And so it's really making me uh, open myself up to new things. And being out here, I've been using a whole new color palette, like uh, permanent, Red violet light I've been using as my underpainting color because it's lighter and it doesn't allow me to get so dark. So it, it's just like this constant learning process, which is just fabulous. <laughs> Maybe we could take a couple of questions. I don't know if there are any in here, but let me look and see if there are any. If you guys want to add some questions, please go ahead and add them in, and then Michelle will be happy to answer them. It says, Do you grid for architecture? Uh, do you, do you use a grid for architecture uh, seams as well? Uh, yes, yeah. In fact, years ago when I first started doing more architectural scenes, I made my own grid. I had cut out a map board that was in proportion and I put acetate on it and I grew, drew the grid right on the acetate. So when I held it up and had a grid on my panel, it was a different grid at that time I was using. It was just a simple, I don't know, five by five square with angles. But then when I held up my thing, it was amazing how off my drawing was. So that was a really great way to start doing architecture is make your own viewfinder out of acetate and draw the grid on it to help you get started. You know, um, architecture, I, I find to be one of the most difficult subjects to paint. Do you want to give us a couple of thoughts and tips on painting architecture? Start with the grid. Uh, yeah, I'll start with the grid. And there's a really fabulous book out there by, um, his last name is Norley. I can't think of his first name, but it's called Basics of Perspective. And he shows you one point, two point perspective. And I read it a few years ago and I really asked my students to read it because it really simplifies everything. So if you know the basics of how the tops of the buildings go down to the focal uh, eye level and the bottoms, it just makes everything so much easier. So i I, I really, I mean, I'll, I'll post that later what the name of the book is because it's escaping me now. It's just like an $8 paperback, 
really simple to read. It also talks about eye level and sea level, and, and it's really fabulous. Yeah. So uh, uh, somebody here says Joe McGurl uses a grid viewfinder, and he sets it up uh, uh, right beside his panel at a slight angle so that he is he's basically doing sight size. He's going from one to the other. Uh, you're not using a grid when you're painting. You're using it when you're designing your composition. Is that right? Right, right. And, and I've seen people do that. Problem with mine, for some reason, my compositions, when I have a viewfinder, I basically have to hold it up to my nose. And I don't know if it's because I'm not doing big distant landscapes. I don't think that sight size would work, but um, I think it's probably a fabulous way to paint. And maybe I'll try that out here. <laughs> Here's a question that says, do you lose spontaneity when using a grid? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I, like I said, I'm not married to that grid. It might, sometimes it might just be where I put a mountain peak or where I put something and then I kind of forget about it. But in my mind, I, what's most important is that value study. So that, that I tape on top of my easel or I somehow attached it to the top of my easel when I'm out so that I don't forget. Cause it's easy. Like I'll have students do a value study and then they, they put it in their bag and, and I say, well, where's your value study? Oh, I put it away. I was like, well, no, you have to like keep looking at that. It reminds you, you know, what your focal point is because it's really easy to get off track. Well, and all of a sudden you start seeing changes and you start, you know, you look outside your composition, you move that tree in or move this piece in. And, and so Charlie Hunter says it's called Ernest Norling Perspective Made Easy. That's the one. Yes. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> I knew it yeah. started with E, but it wasn't coming to me. <laughs> all right. Uh, any other questions? Uh, we've got got a little more time for some questions. Uh, so when you're painting architecture, the one, one thing that always bothers me are the edges. And uh, it, it seems to me that y you want a sense of edge, but if it's, it seems if it's too sharp, it draws the eye a little too much. How do you deal with that? Do you break up those edges? What, what do you do? Yeah, you can really, really try to simplify them. I mean, if you don't paint them in, they won't become distracting. But another thing you can do, uh, what, like- what, what does that mean? Uh, well, years ago, I used to take Photoshop and uh, blur the photograph so that I couldn't really see what was there if I was painting from a photograph. Or if you're painting live, you know, plein air, just don't look at, just kind of do, look at it out of your peripheral, peripheral vision. It's easy to say, but- um, it's kind of hard to do because you want to look and you want to paint every detail. Uh, or the, the, the last option is, which I did for years, if you paint too much in, just take it out, <laughs> you know, manipulate it. Take your palette knife or your brush and just kind of mess it up so that it doesn't become uh, distracting. Okay. Somebody says, what kind of panel or board are you using when you're outdoors? Um, well, it changes all the time, but my newest one is this uh, Centurion linen panels. I don't know if you can see that, but I use the Cobra oils, which I love because I can travel with them. So they're water-based, not water-based, they're water-soluble. So you cannot paint on oil prime. So Centurion makes oil prime linen panels and they make acrylic prime. So if you're using a water mixable paint, you have to use the acrylic prime panels. But um, they're both really good. I love them because they have a slight linen texture. They're not too rough and um, you can wipe away. And I, I just really like them. And I have used the ampersand panels and gessoed them. I tried like everything, but that, and, and you know, it goes through stages, but that, that's my favorite one at the point, at this point, yeah. You know what my biggest gripe is about those panels? No. <laughs> uh, it's hold up the back again. It's so dark that I can't write on it very effectively and they don't leave a lot of room for writing. So whoever's doing it needs to redesign it because it, it is very dark. And if you're using even a Sharpie, eventually over time, it kind of fades in and then it's, it really loses its contrast. Hold up one you've written on. Okay, here's one. I use a silver or gold marker Sharpie. That's a good idea. So I don't know how long they'll hold up. But that's another thing. I started inventorying my artwork and every painting has a number. And if somebody buys one, I write, you know, I know who they are and what number the painting is. It's been really, really amazingly good for me to have that information on there. And I took your advice and uh, 
I did a painting in the Adirondacks and actually you, Eric, were in the background painting with an umbrella and my son loved it and he owns it. And I wrote on the back painting with Eric Rhodes. I like to, if there's artists in it, I like to write who they are and where I was and different tidbits for people that people just enjoy hearing that stuff and knowing about it. Well, I think also it's historically significant. I mean, you, you know, imagine looking at an Edgar Payne where he says, I'm painting with uh, you know, whoever else was one of his contemporaries. It, 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 it's, there's a figure in there. It would be nice to know 100 years from now who that figure is or who the model is. I, when I'm using models, I write the name of the model. I actually write the name of the model and the phone number of the model on the back of every panel. Uh, so I could remember how to text them or reach them because it's like, oh, who was that model? And uh, now that's probably not something that's good if I'm selling that piece, but I don't sell those. I use them for other, you know, for references. But but I agree with you about the dark purple background. Actually, Eric, if you wrote them, maybe they would change them because it is annoying. <laughs> it would be easier if I could use any pen that I wanted to to write on the back there. Yeah. yeah. Well, if, if everybody watching right now sends a, a, a note to Centurion and says, you know, please change the back, they suddenly get a few hundred people, maybe they'll pay attention. I, I think they would. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's, that's terrific. Somebody else asked about your Peshad box or your easel. Okay. Well, I have a few. I have quite a collection of them, actually. Out here... I've been using my uh, Soltec a lot because it's big and cumbersome, but um, I'm getting lazy. I love to park somewhere where I can paint right from my car so I don't have to carry it far. But when I was in Italy and traveling a lot, I was using the, um, uh, I keep forgetting the one. Deborah Hughes was using it the other day. Uh, oh, the, the uh, Edge Pro. Edge Pro. And that's yeah. been really good. What I like about that one, I have the medium size one, which is called the Passport. And it's great for traveling and it's small and I have a little easel. It all fits in a backpack. It's also metal. So my palette knife like just sticks to it like a magnet. And I really like that one. Oh, it's magnetized. Yeah. yeah. So that one's another favorite. I used open box M for years. I just don't use that as much because there's so many knobbies to twist and one of them is stuck. So, uh, but yeah, it's, there's so many good ones. It's that's why I have quite a collection of them. You know, I, I think it's great if you can if you're in a position, try them all because it, it has. Uh, I have not yet found the perfect one. I just got a new one that that somebody gave me that I'm trying out right now. But it, you know, there's there's not one that's perfect yet. Uh, but they all have their pros and cons, and so eventually you'll find what works for you because. Uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm getting to the point where I don't want to deal with a lot of weight. Now, if I'm in the back of the car, not a problem. But if I'm walking up to the mountain, I don't want to carry that that uh, 50 pound Soltec or however much it weighs. Yeah, well, it's, it's, good, probably only, it's only nine pounds, but when you get all the gear, it gets it gets heavy. So yeah. that's my favorite as far as ease of setting up. It's just too heavy, you know. Well, it has built-in legs, so you just pull the legs out. You don't have to put it on the tripod head and so on. Yeah, yeah they're they're actually designing a new one. Uh, they haven't got it out yet, but they're coming out with a new version, which will be coming out soon. Right. Okay. Uh, see if we got any more questions. Let me just check here. Oh, the oil paper pad. What is that? That's um, you said Royal Talons, and. Uh yeah, it's uh, it's Rembrandt, which is made by Royal Talons, and it's just called oil, oil, oil paper. Oil paper, yeah. So uh, yeah, and and by the way, uh, somebody yesterday, well, it was Joanne yesterday. Joanna yesterday was saying take a brown bag or some scraps and then shellac them. And so what's nice about oil paper is it's really it it absorbs. You can paint beautifully on it. And you don't have to go to the trouble of shellacking a piece of of uh, brown paper, right? Yeah, I really like it. I just started using it, and um, I think it'll be great for these small ones. And uh, yeah, it 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 acts well. It's it acts like canvas exactly. Like I can't even tell the difference. So uh, yeah. I I like that. Yeah, it's nice. Do you do you find that paint dries a lot faster for you in uh, New Mexico? It does. <laughs> yeah, because I had some, you know, like the one. The one I was just showing you at the church. No, the one of the of the the truck. I just did that last Tuesday. It's like completely dry, and um, 
People think that the Cobra is like watercolors. It dries fast. It does not. It, it's oil paint. It dries just like oil paint. So it, but it's a lot faster out here, which, which is nice. So if I'm starting something and I can't finish it, I've been putting it in the freezer <laughs> if it's small enough, but uh, just so it doesn't dry. Because when you're using a palette knife and you have thick paint, you don't want it to dry. You can't manipulate it or you have to scrape it off, you know, the night before to make sure it's those bumps and edges aren't getting in your way. Now, do you put it, you ever put any dryer or any medium into your paint? Um, I've been experimenting a little bit with the, uh, the Cobra, uh, was the medium, but that doesn't dry. The, 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 my new favorite one is this Cobra paste and it makes the paint thicker, but, um, and also in some weird transparent way, like if I want to, just scrape over places. It'll add color, but keep it kind of transparent so you can see what's underneath. So I've been experimenting with that and it's not supposed to make it dry faster, but I think it does a little bit. So it's, I've been doing a lot of experimenting with products and it's been interesting and fun. Yeah. So I learned, I learned a couple of lessons and, and uh, I, I met with Kyle at Royal Talents who, who basically told me what I was doing wrong. So for anybody who's dealing with these issues, first off, if you're using a, a uh, they call it water mixable oil, Cobra calls theirs water mixable, others say water soluble. And the, the difference they say is the, uh, the binder or the, 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 there's some kind of a chemical inside. Some uh, manufacturers use a detergent and some do not. Uh, I don't know who does what, but they said that, uh, first off, I was painting really thin with my Cobra paints, very much like I would do a thin underpainting with uh, turpentine, right, or with Gamsol. And I was getting too much water in it, and then it was everything was getting sticky. Uh, so that's the first thing is they, they said, you know, be real, real um, conservative on the water use, uh, because I was painting it almost more like watercolor. Do you find that to be true as well? Well, basically, I do a kind of more dry watercolor wash underneath, and it dries really fast. As, compa as a, compared to using like Gamsol or something that dries slower, the water dries like really fast, and it's just a very thin like underpainting. And then I, I put the paint on with a brush, and I do that um, without anything, just pure paint. And then I use a palette knife. So I don't use much water, and I don't use much medium either. And yeah. uh, yeah. The other tip, uh, which is one you mentioned earlier, but it, it's it's worth repeating, and that is that uh, if you're if you're using oil ground, uh, if you're using an oil primed linen or something, that paint will not really stick well. So that's why you got to be on acrylic. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I found that out by doing some paintings on uh, oil primed canvases or linen, and um, after a while, they had like this little crackle look to them. I was like, oh, what's going on here? And then I looked at the back and it was oil primed and it was before I knew the difference. But yeah, it, it's basically oil paint, but they the emulsifier is soy oil and um, it makes it like a, a salad. You can put soy in and it mixes with water. So it's the same kind of thing. It's just a one little emulsifier, but basically it's still oil paint. Don't eat it. Yeah, no, I won't eat it. Don't eat it. Yeah. All right. Well, I think, uh, let me just double check the comments one more time. Are water-based paints and oil-based paints really comparable? Are compatible? Compatible. The answer to that is yes, to some extent, but not a, not a high percentage from what I understand. I think it's 25%. Does that sound about right to you? Uh, it's 30%. So like if I'm painting and I ran out of ultramarine blue, I have drawers of traditional oil paint. I'll just grab the ultramarine. And the, actually you could use as much traditional oil as you want, you just can't clean it with water then. That's that's what it kind of takes over and it's not water clean. You can't clean up with water anymore. So if it's over 30% traditional oil paint, that's what happens, so. All right, somebody says they use a quick dry medium for their Cobra paints, uh, uh, but she's a watercolor artist and is, is painting more thickly with the Cobras. All right, terrific. Yeah. Uh, so any, uh, any final thoughts or tips or ideas that you want to share with anybody? Um, well, I want to just make a few announcements, if that's okay. I wrote them down, but of course I won't remember. Um, 
I'm doing an Instagram demo on August 27th with World Talons. And I'm doing a um, booth, the Booth Museum. I'm doing a demo for them on September 23rd. And those are both online. Then the OPA Eastern Division, I'm doing a demo in Charleston in November, if that, if that still comes about. And then, of course, the Sedona plein air event that's in October. So, Outstanding. Well, you're pretty busy. Well, kind of, but now the Sedona thing, unfortunately, is right when you're doing the plein air realism live. So I, I'm not sure if I can. I want to watch it, but then it starts. The Sedona thing starts. So I'm not sure how I'll do that. But Well, you know, one, one thing that a lot of people have discovered is they can get the replays. You know, if they, if depending on the package they buy, you know, like the VIP people can get a one year replay. So some of those people are going to keep watching it over and over and over again, you know, because most people have said they've watched it two or three times already because they're getting so much out of it each time. You know, they'll pick up something new each time. Yeah. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel because I, I'm really excited about it. It's kind of fun and uh, it's only, it's under 10 minutes and I talk about a color. And then eventually when I go through the colors, I'm going to start doing palette knife techniques and stuff. So it's, it's fun. And, and uh, I kind of pushed off the last month, but hopefully I'll get around to it shortly. Yeah. And then also Michelle has, uh, you have videos on, on Lil at all and streamline art video. As a matter of fact, I think there's one coming up that's being featured again on one of our dailies. Uh, so, and, and I think you just were, but I'll, I'll just show that one more time so that everybody can see that. And that is, um, Lil it all has, you've got one called Painting Impressionistic Figures. I, I, it's uh, almost three hours. And so that's, that's worth watching. And uh, you've, got, you've got two or three others and I don't have them pulled up here, but they're worth looking, looking at. And so, whoops, I'm showing Scott now. I apologize for that. Scott will be on tomorrow and uh, Oops. Okay, good. Maybe I didn't show it. I thought I had I so. it. Okay, good. So, uh, well, Michelle, thank you so much. This is very enlightening. I think you've uh, made a lot of new friends and everybody make sure uh, to go to Michelle's website, which is Michelle, Michelle. Byrne, B Y R N E dot yeah. com, right? Yes. With one L it's hard. I have to spell it all the time, but it's yeah, Michelle with one L B Y R N E. Terrific. Well, thank you for being on. Let me just double check, see if there's any other questions. Uh, looks like well, somebody said they're gonna subscribe to your YouTube channel. That's you. good. Um, somebody says we paint at dawn because it's too hot otherwise. So I get that. I don't know, I don't wanna get up at dawn. I don't know about you. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. And, and it's been a pleasure. We'll have you back uh, another time and maybe we'll We'll take one of those uh, one of those YouTube demos or something and show it, and and uh, I think everybody'd enjoy that.